pursuant to Executive Order 202004, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. This is a public hearing on bills. Okay, let's see. Please note that there is no physical location for members of the public to observe and to listen contemporaneously to this meeting. However, in accordance with the emergency order, I am confirming that all members of the committee and select legislative staff have the ability to communicate contemporaneously during this meeting through the Zoom electronic meeting platform. And the public has access to, to contemporaneously listen and if necessary, participate in this meeting by the Zoom platform or by telephone. All necessary access information has been made available in the house calendar and through the electronic calendar on the general court website. The notice for this meeting complies with house rules in RSA 91A. Anyone who has a problem accessing this meeting should call 271-3600 or email hcs at ledge.state.nh.us. In the event the public is unable to access this meeting, the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled. Please note that all votes that are taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. And we will start the meeting today by taking a roll call attendance. When each member states their presence, please also state whether there is anyone in the room with you during this meeting, which is required under the right to know law. Um, and to sort of double up our attendance and our stating whether anyone is in the room with our introductions, it would be great if each of you could just state your name, where you're from, um, perhaps what grade you are in, and as well as you know your presence and whether there is anyone in the room. And if you could share just for our guests, the interest groups that you're part of, or perhaps an issue that you care about, that would be great as well. Um, so I can begin and then I'll go down the list of attendees. So my name is Elaine Cadrondo and I am the um, co-chair of the New Hampshire Legislative Youth Advisory Council. I live in Bedford and I am a junior in high school. And some of the interest groups that I'm a part of are voting rights and climate action. And with that, we'll pass it on to, well, Rep. Alexander, would I you just, like to introduce yourself? Yeah, I just want to welcome Representative Ammon. Thank you for coming. Um, I sent you the agenda. So right now we're just doing introductions um, and then we'll, we'll pass it off to you if that works. Perfect. Thank you so much for coming. Um, yeah, I'm Joe Alexander, live in Goffstown. Happy to be here. I'm 26 years old. I don't go to school anymore, but it was fun while, while it lasted. Awesome. All right, um, let's go. There is a she, her from Manchester, New Hampshire. I'm not sure the name isn't there, but if you'd like to introduce yourself. Let's see, I'm not sure what that might be, um, but I'll pass it to Carson in that case. Okay, uh, so my name is Carson Go. Um, I live in Nashville, New Hampshire. Um, I'm currently a senior and I go to Nashville North um, and the interest groups I'm a part of is the education and voting rights. Awesome. Harrison, would you like to go next? Hi, my name is Harrison Smalltoff. I am a junior at Goffstown High School and I'm a part of the education and gun control interest groups. Great, Isabel? My name is Isabel Povey. I am a junior at Pinkerton Academy and I am a member of Climate Action and Healthcare Interest Groups. Thanks so much, Jude. My name's Jude Farley. Um, I'm also a junior at Pinkerton um, and I'm currently an alternate, so I'm not on any interest groups. Casey? We're having a bit of trouble hearing you, but I think it sort of went through. Um, well, thank you so much for coming. I'm so sorry. Yeah, no worries. That happens all the time. It wouldn't be a Zoom meeting without one technical difficulty or another. Um, let's see. Lily, would you like to go? Sure. My name is Lily Tate Blow. I am a junior at Manchester Central, and my interest groups are climate and healthcare. Awesome. Maddie? Hi, my name is Maddie. I'm a senior from Pinkerton and I am a part of the climate and healthcare interest groups. And I don't know if you still want us to say this in this um, little like uh, list going down, but no one else is in the room. <laughs> that would be great. Thank you. 
And thanks so much for joining us, Kevin. All right, Meg. Hi, I'm Meg Sawyer. I'm a sophomore at the University of New Hampshire and there's no one in the room. And um, I'm on voting reform and gun control. Molly. Hi, I'm Molly Ewing. I'm from Nottingham. I go, I'm a senior at Co Brown and I'm on the gun control and um, substance abuse um, committees. Awesome, Reed. Hello, I'm Reed. I'm from Francistown, New Hampshire. I'm a senior at Condal High School and I am on the substance abuse and social equity committees and no one is in the room. Ryan. Hi, I'm Ryan McMahon. I'm a junior at Pinkerton and I'm on the healthcare education and voting reform committees and no one's in the room with me. Great, and last but not least, Sam. Hi, I am Sam Quinn. I am from Concord, and I am on the education and voting reform interest groups. Awesome. Thank you all so much for coming. And I'll quickly pass it over to introductions from both of our guests, but we'll, we'll go back to you soon with um, the next part of our meeting, which is just hearing from you about HB 544. Um, but Asma, would you like to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Thank you so much for inviting me. My name is Asma Huni, and I am the Movement Politics Director with Rights and Democracy in New Hampshire. We are an organization that promotes human rights. We have chapters in both New Hampshire and Vermont. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you so much for coming. And Representative Ammon? Yeah, my name is Representative uh, Keith Ammon, and uh, this is my third term in the House, and I'm the prime, prime sponsor of the bill we'll be discussing, House Bill 544. Wonderful, thank you all. It's really a pleasure to get to hear from you and um, we're really looking forward to discussing this bill. And to all of our members, we've sent out the link to this legislation and we hope that you had the chance to review it. And I can also drop it um, in the chat once again, in case you would like to take a look. And this meeting will be um, a chance for us to learn more about it as a council with the goal of us voting on it to determine a stance at the end of our meeting. Um, so without further ado, um, we will be passing it on to each of our guest speakers to hear the perspectives for and against this bill um, and have the opportunity to understand you know, their rationale and also ask any questions that we might have. So um, as you may all see in our agenda, we have about 20 minutes for each of our guest speakers. And after that, we will deliberate and vote. So are there any questions about how this meeting will run just to make sure we address this before we dive in? All right, um, with that said, thank you all so much for coming and I will pass it to Representative Ammon um, to hear a, as a sponsor of HB 544, um, just from you as, as a sponsor, how you, uh, your thoughts on the bill and then we will open it up to any questions that you all might have for him. Great, thank you for having me and uh, thank you to Representative Alexander for the invite. And uh, I appreciate you guys uh, doing your civic duty by being part of the state legislature's um, you know, council. Uh, this is really exciting. It gives you guys a good lesson into uh, how to get involved civically. So that's pretty cool. I don't know if you remember Carlin Gargas, but she was a former member of this committee. And uh, uh, I heard a lot about what went on here from her. So I live in New Boston uh, and I represent a super district. It's called a floaterial district. And it goes down to Milford and Hollis. Um, down to the Massachusetts border. Uh, this is my third term. I'm on the Commerce uh, and Consumer Affairs Committee, and I'm also an assistant whip for the majority. So, um, you know, I, I help to get vote counts on different bills. House Bill 544, as you know, is a very uh, contentious bill. It's caused a lot of conversation about the subject matter. And to me, that's a good thing because it gets us talking about controversial issues and not being afraid uh, to share our views and uh, get a better understanding of issues. And you know, this one deals with the issues of racism and sexism. And you know, we know that those are morally reprehensible things. We wanna get rid of those from our society as much as possible. And that's the trajectory that we've been on our, as our state and uh, country are making progress on these things. Um, there's a, a movement 
It's called critical race theory. I saw in the agenda, uh, my, my section was uh, critical race theory ban. So I just wanna set the record straight. This bill doesn't ban critical race theory. Uh, it doesn't even ban talking about some of the subject matters of critical race theory. What it does is it prevents taxpayer money from advocating towards a certain view. So for instance, if you're in a class and they discuss some of the tenets of critical race theory, we get into that a little bit, um, that you wouldn't be, you wouldn't have to fail or pass based on your uh, stating your belief in that theory. So think about it this way. If uh, creationism was taught about in school, you could discuss it as some people think that this is the way the world works. The, the earth was created in seven days, animals were created in this order, but you couldn't, the teacher couldn't pass or fail you based on your stating that you believe in creationism, right? We know that would be wrong. Um, and so that's, that's what House Bill 544 does. It takes some of the tenets of critical race theory. It kind of just like brushes against the edge of it and some of the more controversial positions that sometimes are used to promote critical race theory. And it says, we don't wanna fund these with taxpayer money. Um, so I'll, I'll, I, here's what I don't wanna do. I don't wanna box against shadows of what people say the bill says. I wanna talk about what the bill actually says. So um, have, have most of you read it? Who, who has read it and who hasn't read it? So who has read it? Okay, everybody's read it? Okay. So it, it's, it can be a little confusing the way that it's set up, but if you've read it, you went over the, the definitions of divisive concepts. And, um, you know, I, I guess I don't have to read all those for you because you've all, you've all read those, but two of them that really stand out is, and imagine uh, using taxpayer money to promote this idea that one race or sex is inherently superior to another race or sex. We wouldn't wanna use taxpayer money to promote that idea. And another one that stands out, uh, an individual should be discriminated against or receive adverse treatment solely or partly because of his or her race or sex. So we wouldn't wanna discriminate against people or teach people to discriminate against other people based on their race or sex solely or partly. Um, and then there's some other issues here. Um, an individual's moral character, we wouldn't wanna teach using taxpayer money that an individual's moral character is necessarily determined by his or her race or sex. And so that, this gets into the fundamental idea of individual uh, rights. So do you guys know the difference between individualism and collectivism? That's kind of the spectrum. So like America and um, maybe even Eastern European or European uh, traditions, well, let's say, let's just stick with America because we, we kind of had to have a revolution about this issue, but um, we're, we're focused on individual liberty. And that doesn't mean you're selfish. It doesn't mean that all you care about is yourself. What it means is that the individual is supreme, that our beliefs, our, our thoughts, our uh, conscience only emanates from within each of us as individuals, um, that the group is secondary to the individual. And if you look at maybe like communist China, they kind of reverse that, that the group, that the individual has to subordinate themselves to the group. And so um, that's why we don't wanna judge people based on attributes that they were born with, whether they're born a certain uh, sex or a certain race. We don't wanna say, because you're part of this group, therefore we're going to ascribe these negative character traits to you that it's the individual's actions, it's our, our deeds as an individual that we should be judged on. And um, you know, you've heard the quote, people say it a million times, it's uh, Martin Luther King, that we would want a society that where we're judged based on the content of our character, not the color of our skin. And so um, that, that's just kind of like a prelude to what the bill is trying to address is that we're, we're, we're not gonna use taxpayer money, and that's what the bill addresses. It's about spending uh, taxpayer funds uh, to promote these ideas, um, even if it's called diversity training. So you can call something diversity training, and then you can kind of, um, you know, diversity training would be, uh, diversity is something we strive for, inclusion is something we strive for. Um, but if, uh, if you try to promote that one race or sex 
is inherently good or bad based on how someone was born, then that would be kind of a violation of, you know, what America is about. So I'll just, I'll just mention two things. So if you've read the bill um, on page two, the requirements for the state, I don't know if you guys have this in front of you. So the, the main things are um, one and two there. So I'm looking at page two, it's line one, if you have the PDF, sorry, line 11, if you have the PDF version. And uh, it says the state of New Hampshire shall not teach, instruct, or train any employee, contractor, staff member, student, or any other individual group, and here's the key words, to adopt or believe. So uh, to adopt or believe is, that's the key word. And sometimes opponents to the bill kind of leave that, they push that aside, they, they, simple, they overly simplify it uh, to say that you can't talk about these things. And that's not true, you can talk about them as long as you're not passing or failing someone for adopting or believing in those things. You, you see that difference? And then, the second section there, I'm looking at line 14 on the PDF version. No employee, contractor, staff member, student of the state of New Hampshire shall face any penalty or discrimination on account of his or her refusal to support, believe, endorse, embrace, confess, act upon, or otherwise assent to the divisive concepts. So you can learn about the divisive concepts, but if someone says you will fail this class if you don't say you believe in them or in one of them, or you know then that would be against this bill. That would be discrimination against your right to conscience. So your, your right to believe what you want to believe. And then just a couple of things that I'll point out. Um, sometimes people say, oh, this bans diversity inclusion training. Uh, or even that it bans talking about the Holocaust or talking about women's suffrage. So there's a tactic in politics where you create a straw man argument against your opponent. So instead of talking about what the bill really says, you make this imaginary version of whatever you're fighting against. And then you project that out into the public discourse. And then the, uh, the people trying to support the other side have, a, have trouble trying to say, no, that's not what it says. That's not what it says. Um, because it's, you know, it's out there. That's what the public uh, has been told to believe, right? And that's why I want to stress actually reading the language of the bill because um, it's not what someone's imagination of what the bill says that counts, it's what it actually says. That's what becomes law. So um, page three, uh, it's line 32. So people say this bans diversity and inclusion trainings. Well, it says agency diversity and inclusion efforts shall first and foremost encourage agency employees not to judge each other by their color, race, ethnicity, sex, or any other characteristic protected by federal or state law. So I think, you know, um, most people would agree that that's what diversity inclusion training should do. It should encourage agency employees not to judge each other by those traits. And then uh, finally, it says, you know, the opponents will say, this will prohibit talking about this in the classroom. Well, I, my, my rebuttal to that would be, again, language from the bill, page four, line 21, it says, Nothing in this chapter shall be construed to prohibit discussing as part of a larger course of academic instruction, the divisive concepts listed in an objective manner and without endorsement. So I, I use that example with creationism. You know, some people sincerely believe that creationism is how the world was made, but we don't use taxpayer money to pr promote um, that people need to adopt and believe something that should be left to the, you know, our private thoughts. And so, you know, that's really the focus of the bill. Now, how much time do I have left? We have about Another, left. Um, I wanna leave time for questions. That would be great, thank you. But I wanna, I wanna just say one thing to you guys. Um, so this is part of a larger discussion that's happening nationally about, um, it's mainly about race, but it's about sexism too. Um, and you hear the term critical race theory, you put it in the agenda. And what, what proponents of critical race theory don't tell you, and I, I want you to research this on your own, is that critical race theory is part of a set of theories called critical theories. So there's critical you know, legal theory, there's different critical theories, but it traces its roots back to uh, Marxism. Uh, it tra traces its roots back to the Frankfurt School, uh, which was in Germany 
in the 1930s, that it's, it's part of that lineage of thought. And it's really to divide people into do two different groups. So like classical Marxism divided people into the capital, the, you know, the, the bourgeoisie and the, and the proletariat, right? The labor class, the working class and the capital class. Um, but this is using race to divide people. And there's, a, there's an underlying agenda behind it is to gain political power. That's what pretty much every, um, every advocacy is about, usually about gaining political power. So if you, if you dig into critical race theory, and again, 544 doesn't ban talking about it. And all it does is say um, these really, really divisive uh, fringe ideas that some people who support critical race theory use, we wouldn't want to use taxpayer money and train people or teach people that this is the only way, this is the only way to think. So, you know, it's, it's part of a larger discussion that's okay, but Thank you so asking much. or failing somebody on it would be wrong. This, this has been really helpful and it's been great to hear your opinion and um, rationale for introducing this. Um, and if, if possible, it would be great to open it up to some questions since our time is a bit limited today. Um, but before that, I did have a quick question for you about um, this idea of using taxpayer money um, and you know the, the reasons behind this bill. Would mm -hmm. it be possible to have a couple of examples and scenarios in which you know, without this bill, taxpayer money would be or currently is being used in order to propagate these concepts? Um, and how does that kind of show up in our society as it is now? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so uh, in the Manchester School District, it showed up as part of a teacher training uh, where uh, there's a concept that I'm going to say it, and it's going to sound like I'm, I'm supporting something that's bad. And I want you to kind of think about what the word means, but uh, an anti-whiteness training. So that was part of the, the uh, Manchester School District. And it's not about whether it's white or black or brown or whatever color, it's about dividing people based on skin color and saying that certain people are deficient because they were born a certain way and others, you know, may, maybe they're deficient in a different way or, uh, but that we're not all part of the same society in the same group. And so it actually causes division. Um, you know, in my view, that's what it does is it causes division because we're all individuals, we're all citizens in the same country. And, you know, you've heard the term uh, systemic racism and there is racism. There's a history of racism in our country. But when, if you, this is another thing I'd like you to research, if you could, systemic racism, what, what they're saying is that the system, our, the system of our country was designed from the beginning and all its institutions and all the rules and all the laws were designed to perpetuate racism. Uh, and that's a really big statement. I mean, that's sort of like calling America Nazi Germany, right? So we, we know, you know, the concentration camps uh, with the Jews were bad and America's done some bad things, don't get me wrong. But we're, our society is designed to be self-correcting and self-healing. So uh, to say that we need to throw the whole thing out and have a revolution and you know turn every turn turn over every system and, and create something new, I disagree with that uh, point of view. I think the way that our country was set up from the founding allows it to heal itself, to self-correct, uh, because you know for one thing we have conversations like this or we can disagree and make up our own minds and that gets us further uh, towards, you know, what they say, a more perfect union, so. Thank you so much. Um, does anyone else have any questions? If you can. Lily, about you. Hi, um, so I appreciate you telling us all about the bill. You know, I read the bill text. And the one thing that I didn't understand is this bill wouldn't, this bill only makes sense if we assume that nobody is given any privilege based on race or gender or sex. Do you think that is true or do you think that is not true? So you're talking about privilege, okay? Yes. So uh, privilege, it, that term is kind of like a, and this is my opinion, you can take it for what it's worth. It's kind of like a political talking point. Um, there, are, there are lots of types of privilege in the world, right? If you're if you're attractive to look at or you're not attractive to look at, if you're left-handed or right-handed, right? If you're tall or short, if you're thin or fat, uh, 
if you're born to wealthy parents or not, right? There's lots of types of privilege uh, in the world. And by focus, by trying to make people feel guilty for how they were born, uh, you know, collective guilt uh, goes against that idea of individualism that I was telling you about earlier, that uh, to try to tell someone that they should feel guilty for being born a certain way, even if they were born to rich parents, right? Like it could be like uh, LeBron, LeBron James kids, or, you know, just pick, pick an example where it doesn't quite fit the paradigm that we're talking about. Um, that's just the way the world is. We, we need to come together and, uh, you know, it's some of it's hard work on our own part uh, to bridge those gaps. And some of it is, you know, you sprinkle a little bit of luck on getting ahead, but there's lots of types of privilege in the world, not just the color of your skin. So that's, that would be my response to that. So that didn't answer my question. It did. It said, it said your question focuses on a very narrow uh, aspect of what privilege is and privilege. That label has become a, uh, it's a political talking point. And I just described to you that there's lots of types of privilege. So, okay. Lily, if you, Lily, if you don't mind, I'm going to give an opportunity to other people for follow-ups. And if we have time at the end, you can do that. Can if I that ask a question really quick? So you're talking about a certain groups gaining political power. Who do you, who are those groups? Are they groups based on like gender or sex or who are those? Yeah, no, it's not based on that. It's like, a, <laughs> it goes back to what I was saying earlier that there's the, there's an underlying agenda behind this stuff. Um, and it, it traces its roots back to Marxism. And maybe some of you guys think Marxism is a great thing, but there's been, you know, hundreds of millions of people have died because it doesn't actually work. Um, capitalism, capitalism is not great. And, uh, you know, we can do some, we can improve what we have currently, but, um, you know, that, that's what I think is underlying this is, um, trying to control people's actions and, uh, you know, I should be free to trade with you and you should be free to trade with me and we could pull our resources to trade with other people. That's really, you know, the, the way I think things should work. Um, Thank you so much. We are pressed okay. for time. So I want yeah. to see if we can get in a couple more questions. Does anyone have any? I see uh, Sam Sands been out. Thank you, go ahead. Yeah, hi. So thank you representative for coming in and talking to us. So my question is, uh, could a school district uh, give a, an implicit bias training to their faculty uh, with this bill in effect, with this legislation? Yeah, but you, what you couldn't do is say, um, you know, you, you couldn't isolate people by how they were born and say, you people over here have this kind of implicit bias because you were born a certain way. And those people over there, they have a different implicit bias because they were born a certain way. As long as you're doing it uniformly, treating everybody equally as individuals, then that there's nothing wrong with that. You see the difference there? Yes, thank you. No. Any further questions? I see uh, uh, Meg has a hand up too. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. Um, thanks for taking the time to talk with us today. Um, mm -hmm. My question is, when you um, talk about how schools much they can teach about divisive concepts as long as it's in a, um, an objective manner and without endorsement um how do you see that being different from the way it's currently taught like do you see a lot of examples where students like you mentioned are being failed because they they won't um accept certain theories and also uh, or not. I missed the last part of your question. It was breaking up. Meg, if you tried to uh, turn off your video and try asking the question again, that'd be great. Um, um, can you hear me now? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, so my the second part was who gets to determine like, like, how are you going to review whether it was taught in an objective manner without endorsement? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, in the public school, it would be up to um, the parents to, you know, the students and the parents to raise an objection, and then it would go to the school board. 
and they would review, you know, any evidence uh, for it. And maybe that would be, uh, you know, course curricula or what the questions were on a test. Uh, here's an example in Hanover, the, the, the Hanover School District uh, had a test and it said, when, when did America become a racist country? And it had six multiple choice questions on it. And the correct answer, the one that you would pass if you answered correctly, was when the Declaration of Independence was signed. That was the correct answer on that test. Uh, that would be uh, an example of, you know, promoting something uh, not objectively and trying to endorse a certain position. That you know, that would be a pretty blatant example. So. All right, I wanna make sure that we give both sides equal time. So um, we'll uh, have Ryan, would, would you like to ask a question? We can make that one the final one. I can give um, Asna the, uh, the other time. Uh, that's okay, I'll let her speak on that. One okay, perfect. So, Representative Ammon, if we have any further questions, would we be able to reach you through email so that we can get them answered? Yeah, so if you guys know how to look up on the general court, the Gen Court website, my email's on there. All right, sounds um, good, thank you. And, Stick to the language of the bill, if you could. That would be, uh, you know, helpful for the discussion. I think. Thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you. Well, thank you, Representative, for joining, and um, you're welcome to stick around and listen if you'd like. Okay, I might, I might put it on, uh, on speaker. Thank you. Perfect. All right, Asma, would you like to um, present sort of your opinion on the bill and then take some questions? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, first of all, for inviting me. I am so impressed with all of you. Your questions were brilliant and spot on. Um, so you heard a lot today, uh, including capitalism, Marxism. I'm like, wow. So I'm just going to stick to the bill, though. So if you don't mind, that's the only thing I'd, I'd like to address in this, in this um, meeting. So this bill, uh, HB 544, is a carbon copy of an executive order that Trump issued before leaving presidency. Um, it's important to know that uh, it's important to know that because we need to understand um, what the purpose of the bill is and also how it was supposed to get applied. So um, we heard that it was an idea from a university professor, at least that's what Representative Ammon has said publicly, um, uh, a university professor from New Hampshire, uh, that, and that's why he sponsored the bill, but that's really not the case. The bill, even if it was first introduced in New Hampshire um, as the first state to introduce it in the legislature, it literally took the exact language of Trump's executive order. So it's really a part of a greater national project that intends to curb this movement to try to address systemic racism. So we know that one of those people being uh, behind this uh, right-wing national project is a man by the name of Christopher Rufo, who's a former fellow at the Heritage Foundation. So the Heritage Foundation is a right-wing uh, think tank and he actually tweeted this quote. He says, we have successfully frozen their brand and um, their brand, they meaning those people who are organizing against addressing systemic racism. So he continues, uh, we have successfully branded their uh, brand. And then he says, critical race theory into the public conversation and are steadily driving up negative perceptions. We will eventually turn it toxic as we put all the various cultural insanities under that brand. And he continues, quote, the goal is to have the public read something crazy in the newspaper and immediately think critical race theory. Um, we have decodified the term and will recodify it to annex the entire range of cultural constructions that are unpopular with Americans, end quote. That was tweeted on May 15th um, of this year. Uh, unfortunately, the person who introduced this bill in New Hampshire, Representative um, Keith Ammon, has said publicly in the legislature on video that anyone can look at and see that systemic racism does not exist and claim that our country has rooted out, quote, the last vestiges already. So that's important context to give when talking about this bill. Um, which is now in the budget, which is quite genius, honestly, because that means, you know, like the state has to pass the budget. So it was kind of smart way to make sure that, that, that it tries to get passed. So about the bill. So the bill's language is quite deceiving because on face value, it looks harmless. But the problem is the divisive concepts, which the bill is referring to, is literally flipping this idea of racism on its head and calling those who point out systemic racism racists 
against whites, right? And those pointing out gender inequality, sexist against men. So which is absolutely ridiculous. So basically it's supposed to protect people who are uncomfortable when the topic of addressing systemic racism comes you know, comes up because they feel their identity somehow is being attacked when people mention how brown and black community or how women are affected institutionally by racism or sexism, right? So we believe that this is a fake problem and um, that it's not really an issue like they're making it out to be. And the majority of white people and men as well have stated they appreciate these conversations about systemic racism and how disproportionately it impacts people differently in our nations. And these difficult conversations have helped them see the way basically that the, the system has benefits them sometimes and, and others, right? Um, and they say they've now become better advocates because of those conversations. So the fact that people are insinuating that when we say that historically and currently women have been discriminated against as a social group and it's benefiting men as a social group and that society has discriminated against people of color and that somehow will make men um, or white people feel like, you know, we're saying women are superior to men or that people of color are superior to white people is, is really quite sad and something that really just doesn't make sense. So um, if the, 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 the bill sponsor or anyone doesn't believe that systemic racism truly exists anymore, he and uh, those people that have this belief are the reason why we must have these honest conversations that bills like this would prevent because as long as we keep behaving like everything is okay, we'll never address the racism and sexism that plagues uh, and harms all of us, quite frankly. Um, because you know, if we continue to harm women, we're literally harming our mothers and sisters. When we continue to harm people of color, um, we're also robbing ourselves of the opportunity to live in an amazing multicultural democracy. Really fast, I also wanna address critical race theory um, because this keeps coming up. So critical race theory is this boogeyman that quite interestingly, like because this bill doesn't address critical race theory at all, the notion that one group or people is inherently superior to another group, the language from the bill, or that like one group of people by virtue of their race or sex ought to feel guilty about the fact that they belong to a race or sex. None of these things have anything to do with critical race theory. Critical race theory is basically the shedding light of the fact that racism functions differently today. And so this idea of color blindness, uh, color blindness, uh, is not allowing us to notice the ways that racism does function in our society today. It's saying that even when race is, uh, uh, it's saying basically that, uh, you know, race is net, doesn't have to be mentioned for something to be racist, right? Racism still exists and, hap and happens even without naming the word um, racism. So it exists through racial disparities, inequality, racial discrimination, um, and many like disadvantages that research has shown with data that impacts black, brown, Native Americans. That's critical race theory. Um, and the fact is um, in America, you know, America is racist. That's just a fact, right? And this bill would literally punish me for saying so. But we have evidence, right? Not just past practices, but today. And also America doesn't have to be racist though. That's the key. That's, that's why these conversations are necessary and important, right? We do have a chance to get better, to, to, to truly live into that multiracial democracy where all of us, black, brown, white, can all thrive, right? Um, and so talking about systemic racism, um, I'd like to just kind of quickly give like a definition. So systemic racism is grounded in history, our laws, institutions, and it combines, you know, it's a combination basically of these systems and factors in the United States that gives advantages to white people and has disadvantaged in access and opportunity for people of color. So when we're talking about sexism, it's going to advantage, it's giving an advantage to men, for example, um, that, uh, that women and non-binary peoples don't have access and opportunity as well. So um, talking about systemic ra racism and sexism, we're talking about things like the fact in New Hampshire, woman makes 74 cents to every dollar a man makes. And it's even worse if you're a woman of color. In New Hampshire, the rates is, uh, for, we, we basically rank 45th in the nation for gender pay equality. And that's a shame, right? In higher education, it's even worse, that gap. 
Um, when we talk about systemic racism, we're also talking about the fact that in 2018, the poverty rate for whites in New Hampshire was one in 14. For blacks, it's one in five. For the Latinx community, it's one in six. Again, compare that to one in four poverty rate for white granite cedars. So um, also looking, about, looking at the criminal justice system in New Hampshire, if the black community is 1.7% of the New Hampshire population, we must ask why do they make up 7% of the prison and jail population? So that's what we mean by systemic racism. So uh, he talks about um, uh, being objective and subjective uh, and so this bill is, is wildly dangerous because when we're saying that, oh, you can teach about all these things, but you must be, you know, objective about it. One like has to ask, like who gets to decide what's objective and subjective, right? Who gets to decide if a student was failed uh, because of this reason or not, right? Um, especially in the context that I shared about why the bill was even introduced, right? Which is to curb this, this, this energy or this movement around addressing systemic racism. So many people um, stated, including the president of the New Hampshire Business and Industry Association, that they are really worried about this bill because businesses who get funding from the state contracts with um, trainers, basically, they contract with trainers and they found that the conversations are necessary to ensure they aren't engaging in racism and sexism and that these trainings will help them ensure they aren't you know, uh, vulnerable to race and gender discrimination. So we have teachers, doctors, businesses, all these people who come out against this bill saying this is really, really bad for our state. So um, I know he says it only affects state contractors. Let's talk about that. It's important to understand that all, all public schools are partially funded by the state. So it's going to affect all our public schools, right? Um, and then let's talk about hospitals. All our hospitals are gonna be affected by this bill, including Dartmouth, because we get, uh, the hospitals get Medicaid through state, you know, through state funds. So it's going to affect all hospitals and it's going to affect businesses who contract with this, uh, with, with people giving these trainings who get state funds. And then it's also gonna affect organizations and advocacy groups who contract, um, uh, with with you know with trainers that get funding from the state. So literally this is going to affect many, many people in, in our state. And so um, yeah, I, I just want to maybe stop there and then open it up for questions. Thank you so much. Yeah, Are absolutely. Any questions on the table. If not, um, I have one to begin with, but feel free to raise your hands if you have any. Um, Oh yeah, Reed, go ahead. Is this bill being, I, this is kind of to anyone, is this bill being brought up in any other state at the moment? And if so, what's that looking like? Um, if it's already been approved or what they've done with it? Yes, actually it has been introduced in um, other states in one form or another. And I believe there was one state who fully passed it, like the governor signed it and everything. And if I'm not mistaken, it's Iowa or Idaho? I, I can look that and get you that answer. I believe, let's... yeah, sorry to interrupt. I believe it, I believe it was Iowa just because I have some legislators oh, that are friends over there. Great. I believe it was that. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Um, can I add like the interesting thing is um, one of the things that that I do want to mention, like, I, I really feel like this is going to create a nanny state, you know, like in our schools and businesses, the schools basically are going to say it's not worth having our funding threatened in a situation when some parents might find something objectionable, right? So this is really, even if like our states or our local governments want to have these conversations, they're going to steer away with a bill like this because they're afraid, you know, they'll get sued or whatever. It's now a state law. So just want to kind of kind of share that. I know that. Um, oh, wait, I, I will pass it to Ryan and then Jude. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for really saying that all like succinctly and really highlighting important uh, aspects of it because it is important to address the systemic racism racism in not only the United States but our state and I was wondering when we go to say like testify for the bill or talk with other people about it 
do you have any like tips for us of like important um, aspects of the bill to highlight or anything that could like convey the same message that you did? Yeah, um, I could definitely send you some research because I know the legislature loves research. So when we say, when we're talking about systemic racism, this is what we're talking about. And I think it's really helpful to say, um, particularly as white people and as men, so men should come to, should actually say, hey, we want to hear how se how sexism is, you know, um, manifesting in our state. And so I think that'll be a good thing. And I think if you're white to say, hey, we want to hear how racism is manifesting in our state, because we can't address these issues if we can't have conversations about them. Thank you so much. Jude, did you have a question? Yeah, I had a question for everyone. I think I personally have never had an agenda of having to say America is racist on a test or anything remotely resembling that. Um, I think if anything, the agenda that has affected me or maybe not the agenda, but is the omission of certain events in American history that could be construed as racist or sexist, or maybe the complete omission of things like the gay rights movement in schools. That is more what I've been affected by. But I wanted to just ask everyone, has anyone ever had a personal experience with anything um, resembling what Representative Ammon was talking about? I'm, I'm, so I'm just gonna, um, is, are there any other final questions um, for Asma before we um, go into discussion? And I, I don't wanna disrupt the conversation, but at least um, end the questioning. Oh. I have one if no one else does. Uh, can I just piggyback off of that wonderful question? Because I also haven't seen any, any proof of teachers ever telling any students that they're born racist, never. So when these allegations are made, I'm sorry to say, I just don't believe any teacher has ever said, yes, I believe white people are born racist. And these are, you know, some examples that like, I've never heard that. So if people are al alleging that that has happened, they have to come forth with some real proof that this is what teachers are actually saying because what teachers are doing is saying because of systemic racism, whether through you know uh, um, the way we're portrayed in the media or movies, um, we develop biases and we need to be aware of them to dismantle them, right? So that's just another point that I just wanna say because I've never, there was never real proof of any teacher saying people are born racist. Yeah, and that's, a very, okay. and that's what my question hinges around. So I'll be very quick. Um, I, I know that Rights and Democracy does a lot of work centered around human rights and um, diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, so at the bottom of this bill, it says, and I quote, that nothing shall prevent agencies or contractors from promoting racial, cultural, or ethnic diversity or inclusiveness as long as they comply with this bill. Um, but I wanted to hear your thoughts on that because, and this is my own understanding, but if you prohibit the discussion of the reasons for which there may be a lack of diversity and inclusivity to begin with, wouldn't it be rather ineffective to promote diversity and inclusion, um, especially through, you know, education and foster that kind of inclusive workspace if we aren't able to address the root causes? And um, I wanted to hear your thoughts on that, especially as someone who works for diversity and equity and inclusion. Yeah, so um, I guess I want to make sure I got the question right. Are you saying that if we aren't having these conversations, then um, there's no way to actually be able to address the issues of racism and sexism? Yes, exactly. So the Absolutely. bill says that we work to promote, um, you know, encourage agency employees not to judge each other by their color, race, ethnicity, sex, or any other characteristic. But is there any, how can we do that if um, we are not discussing the underlying causes for any discrimination? That's precisely it. You literally answered your own question and you're brilliant. So you just say that we're, we'll, we'll be wonderful and good in the legislature. Thank you so much. All right, I want to thank I want to thank both of our guest speakers. We're just kind of kind of transition over to a quick conversation. Um, trying to have a kind of a deadline, four o'clock, four fifteen. Um, I stepped away from work, so um, do our best to get that. But um, let's just kick it off. Alinka, just pass it back to you. Yeah, wonderful. Um, well, thank you both so much for joining us, and it was very helpful to hear these perspectives. Um, and I think this is now our time as a council to bring forth any sort of questions you might have for each other um, and also just any thoughts we have. And our goal is to be able to vote on this legislation. So I think perhaps the first thing to think about is do you feel prepared to vote on it? And is there anything you'd like to discuss and hash out before we do so?
Does anyone have any sort of points they want to bring up? Oh, Representative Ammon. Yeah, I just want to say uh, I'll leave you guys to your deliberation. Um, going first was a little bit of a disadvantage, and I'm happy to talk about uh, any rebuttals later uh, in you know the opposition. We live in a society where we get to have two, we get to hear both sides of an argument, and uh, that's how we get to the truth. So I appreciate you letting me uh, talk to you, and I'm going to disappear and let you guys deliberate. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for coming. All right, I'll open it up to anyone who might have any thoughts. Maybe we can start with your question, Jude, um, for everyone, which was really centered around have you experienced any situations um, that propagate these divisive concepts in the way that is outlined in this bill? Um, what do you all think? Feel free to just unmute yourselves. This is really our time and I think we can use it however you all feel best. I would say I definitely have not where a teacher has prompted that exact discussion saying that America is like racist where it absolutely is I think based on the very foundation and the way African Americans people of color women were treated during its creation and today but I think that because people feel uncomfortable when we do bring up these topics like the civil rights movement slavery in school I think that like some people might feel targeted and that brings them to think, oh, like they're saying that white people are racist or America is racist. Whereas really they're just being presented the facts of what happened. And it's like, well, yes, it did. And that is what happened. So I, I don't know. I don't think people are directly being told that they're racist. Yeah, and if I may uh, to just back off that, I think that uh, the idea that any discussion around systemic racism will, you know, will equal guilt, uh, guilt. I think that's misguided. I think that, you know, in my school, we've been able to have some very nuanced, mature conversations about systemic racism and how real it is. And so I just think that that's something. Um, somewhat building off what Sam just said, when when I discuss like white privilege, for example, within school, I've never heard someone say like you have white privilege, you should feel really guilty. It's more of an acknowledgement, you know, it's more like I understand that this is something that is unfair and that might happen to me because of my race. And it's something we need to change but not something you need to feel guilty about because you can't really do anything about it as an individual. Obviously I can't change my race. So I think this bill might prevent some discussions such as that happening within schools and other parts of our society. I think going upon that and um, one of my main things with the bill and I think Brian touched on it is like who gets to decide whether or not something is divisive concept. So as Representative Ammon was talking about, it's like um, the onus is on the parent or the child to like bring it up to the school board. And then from the school board, right, then we go further. And I think the thing is that we all kind of, when making these decisions, right, we probably already have preconceived notions, right, as we were talking about, like someone probably already knows where they fall on whether or not they think America is like a racist country, for example. And so I think then at the end of the day, it just comes back to politics. And I think, at the end of the day, the kind of deciding, right, and having like this objective standard is kind of missing from this bill saying, okay, um, this is where we draw the line. And for me, that's kind of one of my main issues with um, this bill. Back right off of Carson, I think, I think that's a very good point because we can talk about things as far as like, oh, what's right or wrong. But I think the most important thing when we're thinking about our students and educators is what's gonna make people the most comfortable. And in my mind, the people that are gonna be the most uncomfortable are gonna be those groups that are marginalized that might be getting, that might be experiencing these in like inequalities, but we can't talk about it. I feel like the people that, the people that are, I don't wanna say privileged because that's the whole, com another conversation that um, we can get into, but like who is who is truly being made uncomfortable and will this bill make them more comfortable or less comfortable? Like how is this actually gonna affect the students mentally? 
Yeah, for sure. And then there's also the whole freedom of speech angle. Like it might create this culture where, you know, as, as Carson pointed out, this bill is rather vague and kind of telling, saying what what is divisive. I mean, there are a few definitions, but like something could, you know, make me angry just because I haven't reckoned with my own privilege. You know, that again, as Lily said, that's getting into like a whole other conversation, but you know, do I get to decide what is and isn't divisive? Do the three sponsors of this bill, who I might add are white and male, get to decide? Um, like who, who has that chance? And then it might create this culture within schools and within the government of people trying to, you know, scope out and twist words and report each other. And I'm not sure whether that's like in the interest of freedom of speech and also just creating that inclusive community. Like I'm, I would be worried about the consequences um, just, you know, of this whole reporting mechanism, which isn't very clear in the bill itself as well. As, as Carson said, when it comes to putting that onus on the parents and on the students and on the employees, how will that be reported? How will, what kind of repercussions will there be if a teacher within a school promotes or like talks about systemic racism, would that mean that eventually the state's contract with the entire school would be terminated, cutting the funding and the education for an entire district's students? Like, I, I'm not entirely sure, but that's, that's something that I think is worth thinking about. Yeah, I agree. I think overall this bill would like, almost scare like teachers or administrations from, from um, and steer them away from talking about like important issues or important like historical events and stuff because they wouldn't want to get pe um, penalized for this and hurt their school funding or get in trouble with their school and stuff like that. I think it would just, it would do more harm. Does anyone have any other thoughts? Um, how do we feel about voting on this? Do we feel like we have enough information um. um i just i just kind of want a little bit of feedback has this been helpful to do it kind of a panelist style i think on yeah i'm seeing nods so i'm thinking on like positions of contentious bills maybe next year um i was talking to a link a little bit about it but uh you know kind of give me a heads up of what we wanted to talk about and then invite um a pro, a pro and against for the bills so that we can kind of hear from people and then uh, respond that way. So I think this conversation has been great, uh, regardless of where I personally stand on the position and Representative Ammon. Um, I just want to thank the council for um, where they, you know, their vote and their opinion. So thank you. Thank you. And I, I think, you know, as exemplified by the nods, it's been super helpful because sometimes just breaking down a nebulous bill into, you know, something that makes sense and we can vote on knowing different sides can be really tough. And this was really helpful. Um, so how does everyone feel? Can we vote? Would a roll call vote? Okay. I think, Molly, you're taking minutes. Are you good for a roll call vote? So yes, there should be a motion. There should be a motion from somebody to support or oppose. And then the vote would be whether whatever the motion is, do you support or like yes to the motion or no to the motion? Okay, I have a motion to oppose. Motion to oppose. All right. Um, going down the list alphabetically, Carson. Okay. Uh, I will support the motion to oppose. Awesome. Um, Harrison. I'm going to abstain. Isabel? I support the motion to oppose. I also support the motion to oppose. Jude? I support the motion. Casey? I support the motion. Let's see. Um, Lily? I support the motion. Maddie? I support the motion. Meg? I support the motion too. Reed? I support the motion. Ryan? I support the motion. Sam? I support the motion to oppose. All right, good work, everybody. And it's exactly four. That was a lot accomplished in an hour. So good job, everyone. Um, Rep. Alexander, what do you think are the next steps for this bill since it's um, in the budget as well? And yeah, in terms of us making our opinion heard. So the 544, I looked on the docket, that's been tabled um, um, in the, basically the, 
the bill is is um, in in the budget that was passed by the house, so the house position. Um, so I guess I would say to draft up a statement and send it out um, saying you oppose the content of what's in um, 544. And most legislators will understand that. And send it to the House as well as the Senate. All right. Right now, right now the budget's in the Senate's hands, so um, it will come back to the House, but the House has already voted on 544, basically okay. in the in the budget. Sounds good. All right. Um, in that case, we will write up an email with all the information on this, and don't forget to check out the Google Drive and all the spreadsheets there, just so that we can keep working, um, keep testifying. And we'll also send out a document so we can all collaborate on a statement on this, given that this is something that we've all sort of been discussing together and it's overarching um, for the council. Um, and I know that we probably have to adjourn soon. So before that, do you have any questions or thoughts um, for us? So next meeting, we just talked, um, Alinka and I talked. Um, can you just address that first and kind of what we're gonna talk about and then yeah. We can adjourn. Absolutely. Okay. So our next meeting, we're considering June 13th. So if, as soon as we get that scheduled, we'll let you know. Um, and the goal for next meeting is to have sort of an open discussion on how the council went this year, what progress we've made, ways we can be more effective next year, and also talking about how we can continue taking action over the summer, even when we might not be meeting, um, especially since some of the bills that we voted on are probably going to be worked on over the summer by different committees and will want to be involved in some capacity. So next meeting is kind of going to be an open discussion type meeting so we can recap, brainstorm for ways to just make the council run more smoothly and also plan for next year. And it looks like we'll be able to have a summit at the State House, hopefully in August. So that's the goal. We're working towards that. Um, and Rep Alexander is also working on organizing a possible meeting in August as well um, with the Clark, which will be really informative and a great opportunity. So there's a lot of exciting stuff to come, but please let us know soon if you cannot make it to the upcoming meeting and um, please keep checking the Google Drive and the emails that we send and come prepare next time just to kind of recap. Perfect, thanks everyone. Have a great evening. Thank you. Bye, everyone. See you all soon.